to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. Don't adjust your screens. It's such a pleasure today to be here with Second District Supervisor Laura Caps. And I make that comment because I've been talking to Supervisor Caps for a while about being on the show, and I'm so happy that we finally have been able to make it work with our schedules. And uh, Supervisor Caps, you're such a esteemed member of our community and a longtime school board member and You've done so much stuff uh, in, in politics and the White House and Washington, D.C., and now you are a member of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. So I'm really looking forward to having a conversation talking about all these really important issues that we all care about. How are you doing today? I'm great. I mean, the sun's shining. It's actually about my 100th, 100th day here uh, as a supervisor, so great time to talk to you, and thanks for the opportunity. Great. Well, uh, let's dive right in and talk about what's been in the news lately, and it's in your district. We've had these tenants in Isla Vista receive eviction notices at CBC and the sweeps. It's referred to Core Spaces as the company that purchased these apartments. Yeah. And uh, we know the, the Daily Nexus kind of broke the story at UCSB about these eviction notices coming. And so all the media, we're writing about it. We're talking to the tenants. And this is a huge deal. This is anywhere from several hundred to more than a thousand people who are going to be affected through this new thing we're hearing about, rent eviction. So can you talk to me about your response, your reaction, your thoughts to all these people in our community having to find new places to live in a really short amount of time? Yeah, I'm outraged. And uh, thank you for your reporting on it. We're actually talking to people. I mean, these are real people. These are their thoughts. This is their lives. This, These are uh, families who've lived in the building uh, for over a decade, raising kids. When I was there yesterday, you know, there's little tricycles stacked up as you would. I mean, these are um, these are people's homes where that's a center where their dignity is, where their sacred space is. And it's also students, which is, um, you know, unfortunately a characteristic of being a UCSB student these days is having to struggle with housing every quarter or every year. And it shouldn't be like that. If you're, if you're going to college, there's enough to worry about, or you're at C city college and you're living at IV, there's, a, there's enough to worry about that you shouldn't have to be struggling to find housing. And really it's because UCSB hasn't done their part um, in this housing crisis. So I'm all in. I mean, I, our team is uh, outraged as well. This is high red flashing alert for our office because these are folks who need help yesterday. <laughs> they are scrambling yesterday trying to figure out what to do uh, with this this eviction notice. And, you know, it's just, as you said, this, this out-of-state company that has no connection here to our community. And so it, it really strikes at the heart of our housing crisis and our poverty challenges all rolled in one. But the immediacy for me are these, these 500, 600, 800 people that need help right now. Yeah. You know, I um, saw you out there when I was doing some reporting. You were walking yeah. and talking to a lot of the, the tenants. What did you hear? Uh, on the ground what kind of yeah. things did they tell you because when I talk to the company they're very non-emotional about it they, they yeah. said we're going to do everything that the law um, allows and uh, we're going to give them an opportunity where no one has to leave immediately kind of cold what did you hear coming from the mouths of the people who live there their stories and uh thanks thanks to my I have an Awesome team, Chris Henson, Jordan Killebrew, Danielle Aguirre. We were all out there. We, we went to every single door, uh, 264 yesterday, and because I we wanted to get them the information as quickly as possible. And we talked to many of them, and their stories were just heartbreaking and so different, too. You know, the, the, the sophomore on her way to class who's sort of deer in the headlights, like how to deal with this new challenge that she's got to be presented with, to the mother who... Um, um, only spoke Spanish. Thankfully, Daniela, uh, you know, is a Spanish speaker. She's essential to to all of our work, and she was able to, you know, communicate well with with this poor person who, you know, tears in her eyes, telling us how she just signed a new lease for four thousand dollars a month, and the reason why she did it is because the security deposit was only eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So she's now getting herself into a bigger hole of a housing situation than she has been because she's desperate because of this company needing to make 
money quickly and kicking people out with very little notice. So, I, I mean, I, I could go on and on. I mean, uh, tears were at the door, um, total confusion. I mean, even the fact that they didn't provide notices in Spanish just shows how out of step this company is and doesn't, and, you know, callous is a nice word for it about the lives of these folks. Yeah. And you and I, we grew up in this community, so we yeah. know this, but a lot of people think of Isla Vista as a college town only. And they right. think it's just a turnover of students who come every year, but that's long been a place for housing for working class families for yeah. for decades and yeah. there's so many members of of uh the latinx population uh that have lived there in the apartments yeah. and all sorts of diverse uh individuals and that's been a place that people can rent and find places to live that's affordable and otherwise in areas that are, are not so affordable and so when we talk about this issue and, and this is probably what the chicago company is thinking this is not just students. Students are bad enough that you would evict students who are trying to go to school and get an education. But this is also families. These are people who are have children who go to Isla Vista Elementary School, where my daughter goes. These are not just nameless individuals. These are real people. This is their lives, their community. And to do that uh, without any sort of notice or, or or effort to talk or work it out or whatever you good people are supposed to do when they're thinking about any kind of changes to a building they, they have not done that so i think they're going to run into a buzzsaw of public yeah. opposition in santa barbara and and, and they're going to learn fast that people like yourself and activists um, don't put up for this kind of stuff for very long no i know and i i also talked to them yesterday too uh the vice president of the company mm -hmm. and uh, I asked him not to do this. I mean, I just felt as though I owed it to uh, the people I represent to give it a shot. <laughs> he didn't really know what to do with that question, but um, you know, he gave me a lot of sort of bland corporate speak about oh, we're being as uh, amenable as we possibly can, and da 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 da. But I, you know, he made when I asked him about the fact that the, the even the, the the bare minimum step of providing a, an, an eviction notice in the language that that. Uh, a fair amount of folks who live there could un better understand. He, he, you know, he sort of said, Oh, we can look into that. And he, he confessed that he didn't, he's like, I don't know much about the demographic. So I was able to share with him <laughs> about the demographic of Isla Vista and thanks for characterizing him. And he, I, that it's such a special place in our County. And when I realized I was going to have the opportunity to represent Isla Vista and UCSB, it made me all the more motivated to have this job because it is, it's incredibly unique um, and, and has real challenges. And the county is the front line for those challenges. So a few people at the door yesterday, I said, they're kind of looking at me quizzically, you know, I'm not, I'm no stranger to, to knocking on doors and have no qualms doing it. So, but you know, this was, it was 845 in the morning and you're kind of catching people off guard. And um, I said a few times, I said, because they're kind of looking at me like, you know, why are, why are you standing here offering these services? And I said, it's my job to help make this better for you. And I really feel that. And I feel like it's, you're right. I don't think this company knows what they're getting into because Santa Barbara community is full of, of real activists and real caretakers. And I hope that people get involved. I mean, now is the time to get involved with legal aid, uh, with Santa Barbara Tenants Unit, with Isla Vista Tenants Unit, with Communify, with all of the good organizations, because this is when they spring to action and hopefully help uh, these lives. Well, good for you. Uh, yes, it's a compliment to a politician from Josh, uh, to an elected official, but <laughs> good for you for, for being out there quickly uh, and doing it quietly. You know, we ran into each other on accident. You, you weren't yeah. looking for media attention at all. You were no. just doing the work. And uh, that's that's honorable that elected official would, would spring into action like that. Let's shift gears and talk about the other big issue of the day, yeah. um, and that's housing, and specifically the Santa Barbara County housing element. I've written several stories on this, and it's controversial, and in a nutshell, and I know it's an evolution too, and you guys are going to have a meeting coming up, you know, talking about new sites uh, uh, that are going to be added, but in a nutshell, what were we talking about? The county has to build, 
housing has to find land zone land for housing and we're talking yeah. something like 5600 across the county 46 on the south coast and yeah. one of the big proposals that came out of the housing element was to rezone ag land around Goleta so on the edges from Glen Annie Golf Club which is not your district but then over to San Marcos Growers and you know the eastern you know the Goleta Valley there and there's a lot of concern and pushback and you know the county's getting letters having you know circulating the housing element can you talk about your thoughts on the housing situation and the housing element specifically and what's going through your mind about this topic yeah it's a doozy i mean housing is the i would say it's the most vexing challenge that my office and a lot of us in local government are going to be dealing with. And I think just to back up a couple of things. Um, first, I was born in Goleta. When I was a kid, it was, you know, a lot of lemetry. So I get, I, I really like fundamentally understand the connection to agriculture there and I honor it. So uh, the second thing is I, you know, we say the word housing element and I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a very complex concept and a lot of the emails that I get are asking just for us to ignore it or to fight it. And I just think it's important to state that this is a mandate, not an option. And so really there's no sort of, are you pro or anti housing right now? Because the way that where we are in this point in history in 2023 is this is upon us. I inherited this like, okay, here you go. <laughs> Have fun. Um, literally, you know, literally the, the maps came out of, of this first initial sites, sort of my first week on the job. And so I'm all in trying to make the best of a very tough situation that probably no one ultimately is going to be happy with, but I'm optimistic to find balance and to work hard and to really listen to stakeholders to make this process, which is fairly long. Uh, we still have probably at least another year till this is all said and done. Um, and then even more years for the for the development to actually happen if they all do. So it's urgent, it's vexing, but I feel as though with just strong leadership and listening, we can do a better job um, and get to, you know, already I can talk about some progress I've made in the last week or so. Yeah, let's talk about your response to the initial housing element. I know that yeah. you work to get, I think it's the Magnolia Shopping Center yeah. included as a mixed use site. Once you saw the maps that the county staff came up with, what was your reaction and where are we headed now? Uh, three things. I mean, first I honor their work. I mean, I, I don't know what it all entails to be a planner and it's, it's challenging. So I have respect for their work and um, their diligence to this. Um, but I thought, yeah, I, I mean, I agreed with the concerns that it was too much, too much impact on one, too much impact on Goleta, two, uh, too much potential rezoning of agricultural lands, which is a key to not only Goleta, but to our entire county. We are an agriculture county. And three, I didn't think is that the county was leading enough by example, by having enough of the county's own sites. So those are the three areas that Supervisor Hartman and I have been literally rolling up our sleeves and looking at maps and like cold calling <laughs> developers and trying to make this tough situation better. And also communicating. I've done a, a bunch of uh, calls with constituents and, and you know, League of, Conserv uh, League of Women Voters, housing forum, just trying to have this be as much of a dialogue with those impacted as possible. Yes. And so are you able to talk about any uh, potential yeah. sites? Or I'd love to. Yeah. I mean, we have good. I mean, again, this is a long process, but um, a lot of constituents have said, hey, we want the board to talk about it publicly again. Um, and so we're doing that April 4th at the um, insistence by Supervisor Hartman and I. So April 4th will be a public hearing where everybody can participate. And the the news there will be um, the addition of 15 more sites into the mix um, so that we can hopefully wow. eliminate others. And of those 50, half are county properties um, that are now being added, as well as a huge project that UCSB's had in the works for their employee housing um, on the Ocean Road, if you've heard about it. Um, and that will add 500 more units to this equation, which means we can take away 500 elsewhere. So that's a that's an important development. And I'm um, really, really committed to the county. I just think when you look at 
all the property that the county has, and I know this is something that you've brought up and others have, it, we should be building workforce housing. I mean, we should be. We're one of the biggest employers in this area, along with Cottage. Cottage has done some workforce housing. I mean, I think that's really the future of housing is workforce housing. I know that Santa Barbara Unified is looking into it, just make, taking care of our people and making sure that folks don't have these long commutes as we have done research on. I mean, half the city of Santa Barbara employees don't live in the city and many live south of Carpinteria or north of Gaviota. A uh, third of the county can't afford to live here. So I could go on and on, but I think workforce housing is really the key here. Yeah, that's those are such good points. And of course, Cottage is such a good example yeah. of, of that. <clears throat> and you know, going back to, to Goleta, I was born at, I guess it was called Goleta Valley Hospital back then. Now it's a cottage hospital. Well, you're um, younger than me because I was born in cottage, even though we lived in Goleta. On okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't not think my, not by was, much, I don't think. <laughs> that's the only option. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I grew up in Goleta too, and I live in Goleta. And so uh, when I come at these issues, it's from a journalistic perspective, but also just like a history of it too, you know, and like yeah. we, we've had, like Goleta's built a lot of housing uh, in the last, uh, you know, yeah. 10 years. And anyone who's been around Stork and uh, Hollister right there, you know, no, knows it. Um, there's a little bit of a back and forth between the county and the city of Goleta. And granted, it's political. The real issues are not those. The real issues is how do we get more housing for people to be able to live yeah. where they work? But there's a little bit of a back and forth between the planning staff, the supervisors, um, not, not necessarily you. You've been above it and just focusing on the issues, but some of the others and and the city of Goleta. And we know that uh, James Cariaco, Councilman Cariaco, wrote a, a, an op-ed. Um, you know, uh, Luz Reyes-Martin, council member, signed the op-ed. And their premise was that, hey, Montecito needs more housing, Hope Ranch, these other areas. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your reaction to these two agencies sort of going after each other publicly a little bit? Or I should say Goleta being really heavy handed with the county. Yeah. What do you think about this 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 spat here? Uh, I mean, I was grateful for it, honestly. I mean, I thought that their voice is essential to the process. And, you know, this isn't personal. This is this is getting good policy. And literally, we're at the stage of this complex housing element where stakeholder voices need to be heard and they're doing their job, right? So um, it didn't bother me what's a, what at all. I mean, I think that this, you know, their, their voice, I, I've been meeting with different council, every council member on that body, um, talking with them, meeting, I just met with Paula yesterday. I mean, we need to hear from them and they need to be loud and they need to stick up for what they think uh, they, their community deserves. And I agreed with a lot of their concerns. Right. <clears throat> Good. Okay. I mean, I've also been around the block a lot in politics. And I think that's, maybe this is kind of where it, it helps because <laughs> I've, you know, I've been, you know, I've been in like sort of intense situations uh politically and i have built up a pretty thick skin you know working in the white house working in the senate working on campaigns and so um i just saw them doing their job right and i was uh, happy they were doing it great yeah and i know it's not your district but when this is all said and done do you think the glen Annie golf club is going to be on that final list i mean it's too early to say i certainly you know we've gotten a lot of uh emails about that in particular. So I know there's a lot of questions about it. I share a lot of those questions, but um, we'll see what happens. We've got a long way to go on this. And yes. I just think it's important for people to, you know, to, to know how to engage and also for people to understand the process. I've found that that has been an element of this, that if I can just explain to, you know, I actually call people when they email me and, and say, can I just walk you through this? Because if you don't, it's one thing to be upset about something, but that if you also don't understand what's happening or how it's happening or when it's happening to you, um, that really exacerbates uh, the, the feelings and the intensities. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've always noticed about you is in the school board is you really love your work. Like you, Jerry Roberts, I think um, he made some reference of, you know, you being like a straight A student, you know, <laughs> you know uh, uh, studying, doing your research. Right. And that shows, you know, like you really dive into this. And 
um, you take it seriously. And I know that as a journalist, you take what I do seriously. You know, you like it matters <laughs> to you. Um, so um, yeah. let's let's talk about the next thing, which I wanted to talk to you about another issue you've been really publicly focused on, on the school board. You're continuing on the board of supervisors, which is poverty in our county. And uh, we know you've had this great op-ed uh, in The Independent about poverty and how we have one of the highest rates of poverty in the, in the state. And we know that child poverty is uh, very high. And when we think about Santa Barbara, we think of, oh, well, must be like Beverly Hills or something. And, you know, obviously those people in Chicago sort of feel that way. But we know, <laughs> <laughs> we know that um, our county is diverse and layered and we have the super wealthy living just a mile away from those who are living in poverty. Can you talk to me about your work that you're doing on the board of supervisors to address uh, poverty in our County? Yeah. Thanks for that question. Cause I, I mean, even just talking about poverty, I don't think people even who live here fully understand it unless you're living in poverty, um, which way too many of our neighbors uh do. Um, and it's it's my office. It's our top issue. Um, it is. Uh, I think it's a travesty that we are close to the top of the worst poverty rate in the state. Um, and California has the worst poverty rate in the country. So th this is this is not something that I have a lot of urgency. Uh, I have a lot of impatience about wanting to make a difference. And um, and I have experience. I've been working in this area of poverty uh, prior to joining the, the board of supervisors for a while now, and there are tools that work. And that's what I, that's the, the, the basic um, premise of the op-ed that's in the independent today is about one of the strongest tools we have is this earned income tax credit. It sounds so wonky. Don't turn off your screens by when I start talking about this, but um, I talk about it a lot because it's one of the best tools we have. And literally it's a, a cash back program that rewards work for our lowest minimum wage and slightly above workers. So, so if uh, the, uh, the women and men who are actually feeding our children in our children's school uh, file their taxes, they can get up to $2,500 back, which if you're making about $30,000 a year, that is very significant money. And it's an important federal program that started literally by President Nixon it's a Republican idea that President Reagan built upon and President Clinton, whom I worked for, expanded. Governor Newsom has done a ton to expand it here in the state. And it just gives people um, that extra cash uh, when they file their taxes, if they do, that helps them pay for rent, not have to be evicted, uh, pay down their credit card bill that they're paying huge interest rates on, et cetera. And so it's, it's really a lifeline and in our county, uh, we're reaching about 75% of the people who have earned this tax credit, but we're missing 25%. So now that I'm in the county where I, we have a department of social services and I can work with these nonprofits, we're just working to get that number up to 100%. Mm -hmm. And when I say that number, it's actually 12,000 people that aren't getting those hundreds or potentially thousands of dollars every year that they've earned. So it's a very tangible way to keep people from having to, um, you know, live in their car or to make ends meet in this chaotic world when you're living in that on that uh, level of, um, of financial insecurity. Yeah. So walk me through that again about yeah. what are the barriers? So, so if somebody qualifies yeah. for this, what are the reasons that we still have 12 or 13,000 people who are not receiving it? What, what, what's, what's happening on the ground? That's literally the million dollar question. Um, they, you only receive the credit if you file your taxes. But when you're making that little, when you're making low income about that much, you don't owe any taxes. So you're not required to pay any taxes to file yeah. your taxes. Yeah. And so I, I relate it to like volunteering to do a root canal that you don't have to do, you would never do it, right? If you don't know that you're going to get money. So because taxes are, it's not easy. It takes, it's complicated. It takes about 45 minutes. There's some stigma about potentially putting down your ITIN number or your social security number. There's fear potentially among some in this population about that level of interaction with the government around your finances. And so therefore people just, they don't know about the taxes, that the credit and the money that can be getting it back. And so they don't file it. 
And so it's really working with community centers and churches and promotoras, people who have trust to say, hey, let's let me help you uh, file your taxes. And then, you know, then you get this, this cash back, which can, you know, again, just be a lifeline. Um, and there's also predatory. I mean, there's, a, you know, different financial institutions that, that folks get burned by because they offer sort of free taxes, you know, the big h and block or other ones. I don't want to, you know, malign these co- companies. But um, so there's there's also that piece of it of, of sort of people might have been burned in the past. Um, and so they're not filing on taxes. But literally money is just it's also, you know, fiscally responsible for us because it's state and federal money that goes right into our county. And we're kind of leaving it on the table. And I want to put it on that, literally put it on the table of people who need food, need to take care of their kids. Yeah. Let me just ask you about that passion and that interest of yours just as a person, because, you know, I've been covering politics for a long time. And usually you hear elected officials talk about individuals and groups who also have a um, benefit to them and maybe in terms of campaign contributions or support you don't hear a lot of elected officials advocating for um, people who are living in poverty because there there isn't a direct link there of what's your payback going to be right like how are you going to a lot of lobbyists for pop for pop, poor people right <laughs> yeah you know how are you going to turn that into campaign dollars <laughs> next time you okay. run so i know i would I, in my perfect <laughs> world there would be the the lobby for poor people would be much bigger than the nra <laughs> exactly so where does that come from uh laura like w- have you always been just like that's been an issue of yours or going to DC and sort of seeing yeah. what, like, where does that come from? Uh, I mean, it's gotta be my parents. I was lucky to, to have so much, you know, privilege and love and nourishment. And it's just a very loving and comfortable household, but I always um, was keenly aware, thanks to my mom and my dad about those who are suffering and those who deserve compassion. And I think it stems from our faith and they were never satisfied at just sort of being happy about what we had, but really wanting to give back. And I, I do believe it's um, from both of their, their, their faiths that then was, you know, uh, I was exposed to from an early age of, of just really caring about your community and that connection to being a person of faith and, and, you know, the least of, of us that, that need help. And then, you know, I, I had the honor of working for people like Senator Ted Kennedy, who was just, uh, I mean, talk about privilege, but so compassionate and so progressive in wanting to, you know, have Medicare for all and raise the minimum wage. And so that's really where the, where my, um, values aligned with the tools that can really help people, um, you know, have a, have a better life. And because we, I do believe that poverty is a policy choice. I mean, we actually know what works. Like Social Security is a great example. That was started, you know, generations ago. That has helped so many millions of seniors stay out of poverty. Um, we know with the child tax credit that was passed during COVID, but then taken away just in December, that actually, um, that actually cut child poverty, child poverty almost in half, about 40%. And if we had, if, if the Senate had extended it, we would see such dramatic ramifications for the generation. So we actually know it works, but there are people, you know, poverty benefits some, you know, back to this company in Chicago, (laughs) Um, not a good day for them if they're ever watching this this, uh, interview, but, you know, they benefit from these poor people in Isla Vista getting evicted. So I have a lot of passion about it and I, I, but it's, it's, and it's, meaningful meat for me now to take what I've the tools that I've been exposed to and the activism and the leaders um, in Washington DC but now for the last decade or so being able to you know try to make my own community even better yeah um that's that's yeah that's really important that you're talking about that and it's not a it's not a campaign thing because you were doing it at the school district as well you know child poverty you know jeff bridges fundraisers all that stuff you know that you yeah. took part in. well that's um, feeding kids in the summer i mean that um there's nothing more important than kids having food exactly yeah i mean in galita I, i've talked about this too but like that the fact that you can get all your meals at you know school is so different than when i was going to school <laughs> it's a, just like the most heartwarming 
thing you can see is feeding a child who needs, you know, who, who yeah. needs food and it's good food, you know? So I wanted to ask you going back to some of the County policy stuff about yeah. cannabis. Uh, there's been some stories lately and some meetings about cannabis revenues. Uh, there's a shortfall in what the County was expecting something like $10.1 million. And we know cannabis has been this huge issue. It was a big issue um, in, you know, uh, one of your earlier campaigns and uh, not just you, there's a lot of people who have lots of concerns about yeah. why are we the cannabis capital of the world now? And why is that, how did we get here? And it was supposed to be the promise of cannabis revenue was going to be, we're going to pay for, for law enforcement and all these services. And here we have a revenue shortfall. So uh, what's going on with cannabis? Um, do we, did, did, was, did we, did the County mess up or is it, we got to take the long view here. What's your perspective? Yeah, there's a lot to improve, I think, but clearly, you know, cannabis is here to stay. It's it's the voters passed it. There's no there's no doubt about that. Um, but you know, I, I am I'm committed to trying to make this ordinance better. Um, and starting with the fact that uh, you know the intentions were that it was going to bring in a lot of revenue to the county, and that just hasn't happened, uh, especially this last year, where um, unfortunately it it cost about as much to administer the program to enforce it and give the permits as the revenue that was brought in. And that's the report that we just got um, from county staff last week, which um, I had a lot of questions about, as I've been elected to do, is to ask tough questions. You saw me do it on the school board. I'm going to keep doing it here. I think the role of an elected official is to kind of kick the tires and lift up the hood and allow that lifting up the hood for the people to see like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and so with cannabis, my main concern is really on the fact that the revenue is down so low. And still, year after year, a lot of the operators aren't paying taxes. Mm. And so I asked one of the tough questions I asked was, um, what would the revenue be like if, you know, you can speculate what it might be like if if all the operators who owe taxes pay taxes? And uh, the answer from staff was probably double. So that's an area to fix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know who would be against, you know, if, if there's this massive loophole that... Um, people aren't paying taxes and that money could literally go to libraries and parks and do the things that, you know, we were, we were hopeful that it could do. That's what my intentions are. now that I'm actually in this position to be able to impact change. So why aren't they paying taxes? Is there, <laughs> I don't understand. Um, how me, is neither. <laughs> uh, me neither. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, we all, I pay my taxes. I'm sure you pay your taxes. Most businesses pay their taxes. Um, but, you know, it's a new industry. It's a cash-based industry. Uh, things are um, still kind of getting going. But um, I asked the question, you know, have any licenses been revoked from those who haven't paid taxes? And the answer was no. So it seems to me an obvious place to go if, you, if you're not paying your taxes and the county's giving you a license and you're up for renewal or so, I mean, I, I think, I think we deserve uh, to have a better understanding and the fact that it's a cash-based industry doesn't help. Um, but still, I think there's ways in which we should as a county be um, protecting taxpayer money. I mean, I take it really seriously when I vote for things. I mean, I, I you know, that I'm not spending my money or some corporation's money. I'm it's, it's the taxpayers, it's the people. And I think our fiscal accountability um, is probably the most important role and function that elect official or board, uh, board supervisor. When we raise our hand and vote aye on something, that's that's your money. That's the taxpayer's money. And that's, uh, that's the motivating factor for me. This cannabis ordinance, now that you've had an opportunity to be on the board of supervisors, um, are there, where did we go wrong? Did we go wrong? Uh, help, help me understand for somebody who's reading Annie Bardock's op-ed, you know, in the middle of, you yeah. know, wherever it's like, holy cow, what happened in Santa Barbara County? Yeah, I mean, what, what's honestly, wrong with it? It would you be know? a long conversation. Yeah. I, I'm trying to just, now that I'm actually in the job, 100 days in, I'm, I'm just focused on how, what do we do from here? There, you know, uh, I get that we have it. We have the most cannabis by far in the state. We're producing it here, um, 20, 22%. Um, but, but I'm focused on, well, how do, we, how do we make this better? And people's lives, people who live near it, 
the smell bothers a lot of them. How can we, we know now that scrubbers, if you really want to get into the details of this, that these filtration scrubbers actually reduce the odor by 85% or something like that. Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we, why isn't everybody paying taxes? Um, why aren't we, you know, why is this still taking up so much of our, of our energy and our time and the planner's time and the appeals? I'm just trying to, I want a smoother, more efficient cannabis program in Santa Barbara County. And that's what I'm working on. And I think that, um, I think the board, I think we'll get there. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm just, I have a lot of energy. I mean, I will say, you know, there's been so much um, focus on it. I think at the expense of housing and poverty and other things um, that people are kind of tired of it, but I'm, I have fresh energy about trying to remedy some obvious things to me. And again, I'm just starting with the taxes. Right. Okay. And then la last thing, if we have a shortfall, what, how is the county making up for that? Are services going to be affected or is it just like we'll use right. some reserves or ship money? Or No, that was one of the points I made is we don't want people now that there's a shortfall um, last year to think, oh no, this, this cannabis funds aren't going to pay for the things that, you know, libraries and things like that. Um, but no, think they're, they're just rolling it over from previous years when things were better and, and hopefully they'll get better again. I'm, I'm certainly rooting for that. I don't want this to be the situation where it's barely paying for itself. You know, I, I want, <laughs> I want to be able to do a lot of, uh, things with the funds that we were promised we could do. And that's, you know, that's the goal in trying to get folks to pay their taxes. Yeah. 2023 we want people to use more cannabis um so they we can count and have more money but that like you said look forward not back okay, okay. Um, uh supervisor caps let's just talk back up a little bit here yeah you obviously um uh, have a very prominent uh name in town your your uh mother lois caps was super high profile beloved uh nurse elected official walter caps professor at ucsb member of congress um and so you have this in your blood i can't imagine what it was like growing up and having those kind of conversations all day around the kitchen table it's just it is who you are and you can tell that you're not uh, faking any of it and you take it very seriously so here you are you, you're on the board of supervisors you're three months in. What's it feel like for you? How, walk me through how how you're enjoying this process. Oh, it's an honor. I mean, I, I it I finally you know I'm really doing what I am passionate about doing, and it all makes sense for me to be you know where to be in the community that I love so much, that I care so much about, where I'm raising my child, where I was raised, um, to work with such great people, and then the issues. I just. I hope you can hear, you know, the enthusiasm and energy and, and kind of impatience I have about tackling some of these hard things. I mean, the county really is on the front lines of people's quality of life. I, you know, the way I like to think about it is we, we keep people safe, um, we keep people together, and we, we keep people's, you know, spirits up. I mean, if things are working in your community, if you're happy with your neighborhood, if you're, you know, we just went through all these storms and thankfully no injuries and no deaths, you know, because of our emergency response. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I feel every day, you know, in this beautiful place where we live that I get to, to be doing this job. I'm immensely grateful, immensely grateful for the path that I was put on and able to do this now at this time in my life. And I have to admit on Tuesdays and sometimes in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I wonder what Laura's going to say on this issue. And then I remember, oh, that's, she's gone. Do you miss the school board? Do you keep an eye on that? Uh, what is your connection to what's happening at Santa Barbara Unified these days? Yeah, I, I'm so grateful for the six years I had on that board. I miss them. Yeah, I miss the women. They were mostly women I worked with. Uh, we had an awesome board. Um, and I talked to them all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I and I also just... It was an intense experience. I mean, you you were you covered it uh, to be on the school board in during a pandemic uh, is a kind of experience in politics that you will never replicate. Um, just with all of that and masks and vaccines and all that, you know. But it taught me a lot, and I think it really only prepared me for this job and the breadth of this job because of the 
you know, just the, all of the different issues that we were dealing with. So I, I keep track. I don't watch on Tuesday nights. I'm happy to have my Tuesday nights back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, know. so it's just me. There's, I'm still there, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's much more civilized to, to, to meet during the day. Uh, I get why they have to meet at night for working folks. Uh, to participate, but I so appreciate, I'm a morning person. Like I've been up since five 30 this morning and it's way better for me to be up on the dais at nine in the morning, as opposed to 10 30 at night. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, speaking of, uh, how, how is Oscar doing? You, you, you are a, uh, you know, a mom, you're, yeah. you have your, you're elected official. You previously had your consulting firm. You know, you're raising a young son. And Jerry Roberts tells me he sees him out there on the pony baseball field, you yeah. know, as. Um, but um, how, how is he doing? And can you talk a little bit about sort of like work life balance with this, um, you know, being in that role? That yeah, role no, he, I mean, he's, he's the best job I have by far by far <laughs> um actually pretty easy i just had his parent teacher conference yesterday and his dad and i walked out and we we're like you make our job pretty easy he's a he's a great kid um he's a great kid he's just uh he's really compassionate and he always sticks up for the underdog and that's the thing i'm probably most proud of yes well who knows what the future holds uh you know for him growing up you know with you and your house definitely not politics definitely not politics <laughs> he's clear about that he's uh he's pretty into music so um, you know, no crystal ball, but that's where I'd see at this point where he'd go. Yeah. Last thing before we wrap up, um, you have worked on the national stage. You know, you've talked about being a uh, speech writer and correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, you worked for Bill Clinton, pre former President Clinton, uh, yeah. John Kerry, I believe you, wrote, you, you yeah. worked for him as well. And so you've been on that big stage. As you mentioned, you know what it's like. You've been you know, talk to national media, nothing really intimidates you. You've seen it all. And uh, here you are choosing to give back to the community that you grew up in, right? You could be doing a whole bunch of other things. Um, but when you look at the national picture, the national stage that we're in, and, you know, is Trump going to get indicted and all this stuff that we're, it's so embarrassing. It's the federal yeah. national, you know, the Supreme Court decision, you know, reversing Roe versus Wade, you know, how much of your time do you think and worry about what's happening in D.C. And, and the politics and, you know, for people who are just fed up and frustrated? What do you say, you know, just as somebody who's been there? I mean, how can we not be frustrated and fed up? I try. Let's see. I, to answer your question, I try to limit that of exposure. I think that's better for our mental health at this point. Um, but I can't not, you know, care about the issues. I mean, uh, gun violence is top of the list and and. Um, you know, what I guess what's wonderful about where we live is that we can have an impact locally. And so sometimes literally, you know, I am frustrated or scared about a, a national issue and then try to think, okay, what can we do here? Um, you know, like Moms Demand Action is a, a local group that I've gotten involved in. And you read about these or, you know, see the horrific Uvalde and these, uh, these shootings. I just try to focus um, my energy and my angst about with the local folks who are doing good work here. And there's so many, as you well know. Um, so that's kind of a coping mechanism, but also just a way to, yeah, just a way to channel the energy. And I, th and, you know, I recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time, Supervisor Caps. This has been a yeah. really enlightening interview and conversation. And thanks so much for taking time to share with uh, your constituents and my audience, sure. all the stuff that you're working on. It's certainly an exciting time for for you and there's so much work to do and so much opportunity for impact so thanks a lot for your time yeah let's do it again josh okay thank you have a great day thanks